Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dave Iverson, contributing editor at the Michael J. Fox Foundation and an emeritus member of the Fox Foundation's Patient Council. Our topic today, as you all know, is caregiving, and it's a subject that I think affects everyone whose lives are affected by Parkinson's disease, and that's whether that involves care for ourselves, for our spouses or partners, our parents, or our siblings. In my own life, I first experienced caregiving, witnessing my mom taking care of my dad during the late stages of his Parkinson's disease. And then decades later, I experienced it more directly when I became the principal caregiver for my mom during the last 10 years of her life. And while I happen to be doing really well 15 years into my own diagnosis with Parkinson's, my wife still keeps a sharp eye on me, um, as I have tried to do for her during her own journey with breast cancer a few years ago. I guess I'm saying all this because I really believe that caregiving is a universal. We all experience it, and we all experience it each in our own way. We are challenged by it, I think, um, and also changed by it. And that's what we want to talk about uh, today. One other housekeeping note before I introduce our panelists. Um, we've already received um, lots of wonderful uh, questions from all of our um, uh, webinar participants today. We will do our best to answer as many of those as we can. And you'll see a little Q&A box on your screen. Um, if you want to add a question now or throughout the hour, do that, and uh, we'll, we'll get to those questions as our, as our webinar uh, progresses. But let me introduce um, who's joining us uh, today. Um, we have Christy and Prince, uh, Prentice Brooks joining us. They join us from Tempe, uh, Arizona, where they both work as human resource uh, professionals. Christy was diagnosed with Parkinson's back in 2013, and Prentice is her husband and care partner. So Prentice and Christy Brooks, thanks so much for being part of our, our discussion today. Karen Fixel also joins us. She's Managing Director of Liminal Ventures in Santa Monica, uh, California. Liminal invests in health and wellness technology companies. Her father has lived with Parkinson's for more than 20 years. Taryn is also a member of the Fox Foundation's Leadership Council. Taryn, welcome, and thanks for being part of our discussion as well. And last is Amy Cheshire. Amy is a licensed clinical social worker at the Parkinson's Foundation Center for Excellence at the University of Rochester in New York, where she joins us today. She provides counseling, guidance, and support to families living well with Parkinson's disease and to assist in that process. So thank you all for being part of this discussion. And Prentice and Christy, I'd like to start um, with you and ask you to sort of go back in time a little bit to your diagnosis, um, Christy, back in, in 2013. After you spent some time, I'm sure, getting used to the reality of that diagnosis, I'm interested to hear what your first thoughts were about Prentice, um, really, and about how he would be able to provide the kind of care and support that you thought you might need over time. What did you think at that, that, that time? What, if any, were your concerns about how that might unfold over time? Okay, Dave, well, I was first diagnosed. Um, Prentice is out of town on a business trip, and I was home by myself, went to the neurologist, got, diagnosed, got my diagnosis, went home. Of course, he came home like that night from on his flight, and one of the first things I said to him after I said, hey, I got the, I got the results from the neurology appointment, I said, you're going to have to take care of me one day. And he looked at me and said, Okay, and I said, I don't want you to take care of me. I don't want anyone to take care of me. I wanted to be very independent, so that was very hard. And he just stepped into that role and said, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm here for you. And so that became a very good thing as we saw it. Eventually, I would be like, like when you say that your wife keeps a sharp eye on you, that's what Prentice does. He keeps a sharp eye on me right now. But the first, the first thing was I didn't want him to take care of me. I wanted to be, I had always taken care of my family, and I didn't think that I wanted to be taken care of. Yeah, and and, and how did you how did you negotiate that, knowing that 
Chrissy very much wanted to be independent, but sort of maintaining a kind of perhaps a, a, a vigilant uh, eye all the same. <laughs> Well, Christy is, has always been very independent, and that's one of the reasons why, why I married her over 33 years ago. And, you know, from, from my experience, caregiving, my first introduction to that was also watching my mom take care of my stepdad uh, during his last years as a, a dementia patient. And so I got to see that evolution, and there were challenges and frustrations. My mom, my mom did a wonderful job, you know, under the circumstances. And, and so, you know, coming back from that business trip and knowing that she had gone to the neurologist, you know something is going on. And, and so it's just a matter of, you know, taking that evolution and say, okay, there are times when I need to step in, times when I not need to step in. And so far, I haven't. Uh, you know, when it comes to her Parkinson's, we, you know, we negotiate some things as a result of some surgeries that she had shortly after she was diagnosed, uh, you know, and so you learn how to work through that. Uh, but it's, it's some, you know, as circumstances happen, then you, you have to figure out, do I lean in a little bit more or do I stay, you know, kind of allow that independence? Would you say then, Prentice, that the, the key the key quality that you need most is to be attentive, um, to just really pay attention. Yes, uh, pay attention, you know, be observant, uh, be willing to ask questions about, you know, how she's feeling and, and what's going on with her. Uh, you know, that is something that, you know, we had an experience uh, with a, a hike this past weekend that uh, Christy wasn't feeling well, but she still wanted to do that. And so I was just asking questions, you know, how are you feeling? Do you want to continue to go on? And she, she did, you know, she, <laughs> so it's, it's just something that you have to experience, you know, in yeah. the moment. Yeah. And Taryn, uh, so let me bring you into this conversation and speak to it from the point of view of a daughter, because it's obviously a different kind of relationship but I'm sure in some ways the same qualities uh, apply to be observant and to pay attention. How has that evolved for you over your dad's long journey with Parkinson's disease? Um, we've really worked to, as a family, design alliances. So we try to be very articulate because um, what, you know, as you know, um, one day is different from the next. Some days are better than others. And so you might want help on a Monday and not want help on a Tuesday. And so really making sure to be um, articulate and say things like, how would you like me to, you know, how would you like me to ask you when I think you might need help? Um, yeah. So that before we're in the moment, we, um, we have some understanding of what would make him feel supported rather than nagged. I think what you're saying um, is so useful that someone might want help on Monday but not on Tuesday. And, and Amy Cheshire, let me ask your perspective on that because I think one of the challenges in caregiving is to be accepting of that um, and not immediately say, but yesterday you said this. Um, so. <laughs> Help us kind of put that into perspective from what you see as in your in your social work uh, uh, experience. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I often tell just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean that you're immune from everything that happens to people that don't have Parkinson's. So <laughs> we all have our good and bad days, right? Um, and sometimes um, for a variety of reasons, um, you just may be having a really bad day. And um, so whether you didn't sleep too well last night or you're kind of just low on energy or didn't eat well, um, but to really recognize that, you know, it's pretty common that people will be having, you know, off days and to not overly read a lot into it probably if you can, which is easy to say and sometimes hard to to keep in perspective. You know, sometimes our neurons are firing basically quite nicely, as I often say, um, and other times they see a little sluggish. So I think um, just kind of being aware of that and um, 
kind of always trying to fall a little bit more on some self-compassion uh, can, can make daily life go a little smoother. Let's take a look at our, our next slide, if we, if we might, um, because within that is a, a quote from, from Michael J. Fox about um, his own uh, care partner relationship uh, with his wife, um, uh, Tracy. So if we're, we're able to, to take a look at that, um, uh, you know, that, that will give us a, a sense of, of where we want to go um, next. Um, because as we, we've been discussing already, it is about, I think, um, adjustment and, and change and, and how we um, manage those things. And so coming back to you, Prentice and, and, and Christy, what's, what's surprised you about, about those changes? What's, what's, what's taken you back a bit, perhaps, and thought, well, gosh, I didn't, I didn't think I'd, I'd need to do that. Um, I remember you were telling me a story when we talked on the phone, and perhaps you'd be willing to share that, Christy, about the importance of, of looking good and, um, and something that you wind up having to ask Prentice uh, to, to assist you with. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I was diagnosed, I unrelated to Parkinson's, I had a shoulder surgery, and I had, in fact, four shoulder surgeries. And the last one was pretty brutal, and it was, I had to be immobile the whole time. I mean, three months of total immobilization on my shoulder. And it was really hard to, to do some things, and one of those things was to um, take care of my hair. Um, and so Prentice, actually learned how to use a blow dryer and um, a fly iron, <laughs> learned how to iron my hair. Because that was really important to me, like they said, I needed to look, I needed to not be frumpy. I wanted to look together. And so he learned how to get up, do my hair in the morning, put lipstick on me, put a nice shirt on, just for me to sit on the couch and watch HGTV another day, you know, while I was mobilizing. But I did feel like if I felt better, if I looked better, I was going to start feeling better. So, um, I, I hope that's on your your uh, your your bio now. If you've added that <laughs> yeah. to your to your uh, to your your resume, um, hey. yeah. I, I can say that that was a that was a big challenge for me. I didn't even think about that ahead of time just from the aspect that I'm the youngest of three children and we have a daughter and Christy usually handled her hair. There were a couple of times when I did have to do that and that's when Christy was out of town when she was younger and, and our daughter would say it was a big disaster. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so, you know, coming to, to work through that, I had to be very patient and learn and Christy would guide me through that. <laughs> I have to be frustrated and, and so now I have a little bit better understanding but but the good thing about it is where we live now uh, Christy's cousin lives here and is a hair <laughs> hair designer yeah. and so she would be willing to come over and do anything if I could not do it at this point in time but that whole part Dave about you know mm -hmm. looking good I guess my little moment of vanity I you know I get a, a monthly massage before COVID I got a monthly massage I also got a monthly facial and I told Friends, I get the massage for Parkinson's and the facials just because life is hard. Yeah. <laughs> and so just treating myself to that makes me just another component of, I don't know, makes me feel a little better about myself. And, and Amy Cheshire, is there a, a lesson in that about um, the importance of just kind of asking uh, for what you need? Um, it seems obvious in a certain way, but I think often we're not always great about that with our, our care partners or with our parents for just saying, hey, this is what I need, being willing to, to say that. Amy? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, one of the things we we talk about, you know, with care partners frequently is one of the hardest things for many of us, myself included, is you know asking for help, right? Um, because that causes us to feel kind of vulnerable, kind of dependent, um, and so it really is a fine art if you can work on it and practice it. Um, it really can help, especially through this pretty long journey related, you know, to caregiving. Um, but really, and you're not always going to get the answer you want, which is what I kind of tell people to be mm -hmm. prepared for. Um, but it's amazing how many people um, 
can often be surprised when they really reach out and ask for help, whether it's with a spouse or a neighbor or the mailman or your rabbi or whoever it is, um, that um, people more often than not want to help. I also tell people kind of the more specific you can be with your request, um, the better they tend to land as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great point about specificity is, mm-hmm. is, is, is really helpful rather than just saying, well, tell me what I can do. Um, if you can, if you can be, be specific, that, that matters. Tarn, um, I'm interested in your perspective on this too, and about, um, perhaps how you've worked, tried to be a support to your mom um, and, and helping her ask perhaps for what, what she may need as a care partner. It's a great question. Um, I think the, the number one thing we've tried to do is to give my mom breaks. So um, on occasion, my mother will go visit another one of my siblings and I'll go and stay with my father or one of my siblings will go and stay with my father and um, she'll come visit me or go away with girlfriends. And those breaks have been incredibly important for her and actually a really nice bonding experience for us as well with my dad. And that's something you've had to manage from some distance. You now live in California. Your folks live on the East Coast. I'm not sure where all of your siblings are, but... This also requires a lot of coordination and scheduling, doesn't it, as far as kind of making those alliances functional? Mm -hmm. It does, but we're, you know, we try to be communicative. Sometimes, um, you know, it's better than others, but we're, we've learned how, you know, we've learned how each other like to communicate about things too. Um, and we're very lucky. So we have a very um, cohesive family. All of us are very involved. And I would say that's an important thing too, is to make sure that the caregiving among the children is shared. Even if it's not, even if, you know, you might find that different people have different specialties and let them lean into the thing that they are good at doing. I think that's really, really a great point. We're not all oriented in the same way. We don't all have the same talents and skills um, and and to take advantage and be accepting also of that because, um, and maybe we can talk about this some more, but well, let's just talk about it now because resentments can, can build up. If you feel like you're doing more than your sibs are or, or whatever, that's something that can, have you, have you, have you, has that been an issue for you, Tarn? And how have you worked through that if it has? Um, we're all very involved, so I don't think that's been um, as much of a challenge for our family. But we're, we've definitely had moments where somebody has need to say, you know, I need to pause. And we've over, we've been, you know, working with Parkinson's for over 20 years. So, you know, that process of how we've developed that um you know, that way of communicating with each other has changed and needed to get a lot. I think the point about specificity is really great Um, because you don't want to say, I need to pause five minutes after you need to pause. Right. You want to say, I need to pause five minutes before you need to pause. Yeah. Um, Because I found that that, at least for me, can lead to, you know, if I, if I wait too long, I've, um, already crossed a certain mental threshold and that's not useful for my dad. Let's um, let's deal with some of the really good questions that are, are coming in this morning and let me throw a couple of those out and then we'll get back to other parts of our conversation. Uh, this individual um, writes in, um, uh, Dave, my husband is very private um, and a very private individual person and he rejects most help. What can I do? Amy, could you take that one on? If someone is very private, doesn't want help, how do you go about negotiating that? Um, Yeah, that's a a good question and a common one. Um, There's usually a, a couple of things behind that. Sometimes when people use that term private, they may mean more introverted, Um, perhaps as well and sometimes you know folks that are sort of wired that way kind of get more stressed by having 
new people in the situation or strangers kind of coming to them. So, you know, I think instead of trying to kind of change someone's sort of natural wiring um, and trying to get into all the resistance about that, if you can find, um, you know, a different way to go about it. Um, sometimes sharing how it would help you and to really make it like your problem instead of the person with Parkinson's problem. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. this is something, you know, that I'm really, you know, starting to get kind of stressed and I know I need to take care of myself or this is what my doctor's telling me. Um, you know, if you might consider something, you know, and start off very tiny and small because you want to build for success, right? Um, to see if it really, if you can make it more about you and not so much about the other person. Oh, because sometimes folks with PD will think, oh my God, I must be getting really bad. Now we need to bring in help, right? So, you know, I think, uh, again, kind of um, trying to not really try to, res you know, change the person, um, but to really kind of put it more back on yourself. Um, sometimes, that may help. Prentice, I'm interested in, in your perspective on this as a spouse. Have Has it been hard for you, easy for you to go about asking for what you need? Um, you know, we were talking a bit before about, Taryn was making the point about if you need a break to sort of be sure to say that before you need the break rather than five minutes after you need it. How have you, have you faced that um, Prentice, and what would you advise others about being able to speak up for your own your own needs as a care partner? Well, currently, I, I haven't had to face that yet because you know, Christy, where she's at in, in her journey with Parkinson's, she still is very capable of doing a lot of things herself. And I mean, she's still currently working right now. You know, I, I go back to the example of my mom and there were times mm. where I felt that she needed to take a break and she didn't. And it was very, very grueling on her. And, and so, you know, from that model, I, I feel that the best thing for me to do is to, is to keep our children uh, engaged in what's happening. And they are sometimes too much at this point in time. <laughs> we were just talking and, and Christy was saying that now we have uh, two helicopter children who sometimes overreact <laughs> and based on some situations as we communicate with them about, you know, the latest uh, as far as what we're experiencing. But, but for me, it really goes back to myself. I had a situation three years ago where I had two surgeries within three months of each other where I was literally on my back for three days and Christy had to take care of me. And, mm -hmm. and so thinking back to that experience that when she provided caregiving for me, I literally had to ask her to do a lot of things that, that I was, would not have asked mm -hmm. anyone to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so from that example, it, you know, it kind of reminds you that, okay, now I can put myself in her situation and understand what she's feeling and experiencing. And that's the important thing. I need to check in with her. How is she feeling? What is she experiencing? And then from that can get a gauge of how much do I need to be involved? Yeah, that's a really good point to remember what that's like from a kind of first person um, point of view. Let me ask another um, audience um, question which has come in, which is um, I think a tricky area to negotiate as well, which is how can I remind my loved one uh, to use his walker or to stand up straight without sounding like a nag? Um, uh, Amy, um, <laughs> let me turn to you and Karen, maybe you have some, some thoughts on that as well, but Amy Cheshire. Uh, yes, this is... Um... I can't tell you how many times this dialogue goes on in my office here. Uh, and there's never a perfect or great response. Um, you know, I think sometimes if you can, um, as a care partner, um, shift gears and put yourself in the other person's shoes. So would you want someone um, to be telling you those same things if it was you? And, and that will give you a good barometer, I think, about sort of what's the temperature here uh, that's going on, you know, between the two of you. Um, all of this tends to come from a very well-hearted uh, place, no doubt, and I think it's where caregivers get caught, too, um, because I think the 
people will call that nagging or friendly reminders or um, I think it's a way to try to feel like you're trying to get some control over the situation, right? Um, and Parkinson's is such a tough one because there's so many things that that you feel like you don't have as much control over. So again, I, I try to remind the person with Parkinson's that most of this is coming from, you know, a well-hearted place. Um, it's often hard for caregivers to, what I notice, to stop doing it <laughs> uh, once it kind of gets, you know, started. And what happens is many people then just kind of start to tune it out, quite honestly, <laughs> uh, you know, that I notice. Um, so it, it's just, it's it, there's not an easy solution, I guess, yeah. to it. Um, yeah. Turn, uh, interested in your point of view as a, as a daughter in this, how you perhaps notice this uh, with your folks or how you've tried to encourage in that direction because there's also real there's also it's not just being good-hearted as as amy is saying it there's also real safety concerns you can worry mm -hmm. about you know my dad used to fall all the time and so you 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 know you may feel like you're being a nag about about standing up straight or being careful how you stand up or using a walker but there's real consequence sometimes to to someone not um, uh, following those 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 um, activities, how have you wrestled with that, um, Taryn, and, and with your folks? I would just say I feel like a nag. How would you like me to run lines <laughs> of this in a way where I don't feel like a nag or where you don't feel like I'm nagging? Um, again, just kind of calling it, um, naming mm -hmm. naming what's going on. Um, and then the other thing that I often find myself doing is saying. Um, uh, you know, I don't feel like I'm able to help you if we do it this way. So if we do it this way and you fall, I'm not in a position to support you. Um, so, you know, how could we do it differently so that I can actually help you? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, really, really useful, I think. And there's, as there are no simple land, there's, I mean, a, a, tr a caregiving truism, I think, is that there are no simple answers. And when you've answered them, the answer will change tomorrow. So it, it's <laughs> it's sort of ongoing in, in that way that I think builds in its own own challenges. Um, we should we should reference the the current circumstance, um, though we've, that's on one of the slides, and and the pandemic is a reality for all of us, and it changes, and makes more challenging. I think all of these um, questions. So, another question from the audience: How do you go about during uh, a pandemic um, to 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 ask? Uh, for help. There's more, it's trickier to bring caregivers additional help perhaps into your home if you're able to do that because of the pandemic. Things change more readily because of the pandemic. Um, Amy uh, Cheshire again, any, mm -hmm. any thoughts on how to cope with these very questions during a time when everything is harder because of, because of COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this, um, idea of social connection and social engagement um, is, uh, you know, so huge, you know, for all of us. And um, we've all been called to task during the pandemic about how do you keep any of that going. And then I think you add Parkinson's into the picture uh, and you just add another layer. We're always concerned about caregivers feeling isolated. Um, and we know this starts to go on when we kind of stop hearing from people. Um, you know, they used to check in on a semi-regular basis for whatever reason, and then we stop getting the calls. And so we know once caregivers start to find like they are pulling back and getting isolated, they're often maybe starting to feel more hopeless about the situation and um, starting to really spiral. And I think the pandemic, um, has often just added to that. I know we've, um, you know, tried to really encourage people to think of kind of more creative ways um, to to keep engaged um, and to uh, keep asking for help. I think the biggest thing is to find ways to keep asking, you know, um, for help. It's probably not going to be as much in person. Um, I know our, for example, our 
home health agencies um, have been really overrun. You know, I'm having to spend many hours trying to find a home health agency that will even have available physical therapists right. to come out to the home, for example. And that's as a professional trying to deal with it, that I can only imagine that it's doubly hard for our families. So um, I think it is, you know, one, being your best friend can be very helpful here, okay? And I think I've always told people to, especially during COVID, to manage your expectations is super important and to try to not put so much pressure on yourself um, during this pandemic. But keep the important thing is to keep reaching out in whatever way you can, whether that's through the phone, through Zoom, um, writing letters, you know, whatever kind of creative ways, but to don't lose that engagement, um, just really important. Christy and, and Prentice, what would you add to that? Because the world does get smaller when you have a condition like Parkinson's. It, it gets smaller still with the pandemic and our lack of ability to, to, to reach out. You're both still working. You're both still active. You both were just out on a hike. You have those helicopter children. You've got, you've got a lot of engagement. Um, but what, what suggestions do you have along those lines to, to maintain connections um, during this, this really challenging time? Yeah, so one thing Amy said um, about, you know, try to find those engagement, it looks different, right? It looks very different. We, um, when we used to have people in our home, we used to, I used to go to boxing class when, and I, when I was in the office, so I had a lot of interaction with my coworkers, and now I don't have any of that. So we don't go boxing, so a group of our Parkinson's people, we meet and uh, once a week and we hike. So we're socially distanced on the, and we're outside. So we've kept that connection and you just have to, I think we have to find the connections differently. We have to be comfortable that Zoom is going to be our connection instead of in person. And, and how can we make that as, as real and as intimate with the person we're Zooming with as possible and, and you know, be satisfied with that. But you have to really work hard to make the connections and they're going to be different, but still try to figure out how to do them. I would, I would add to in. that. Sorry, Prentice, go ahead. I would add to that that, you know, for me, it's been that I have a circle of friends that uh, even before COVID, we would be meeting over Zoom because they're not located here. And these were people that through the years I've worked with and, and we all you know, had, had left an organization and, and are doing different things. And so continue to meet with them every month or every other month and that has continued, you know, even through COVID. And then most importantly, take care of yourself. Uh, I, I make sure that I exercise, I try and get enough sleep, you know, when possible. And you know, and make sure, you know, eat properly. So, so those are the important things that that, that has really helped me. And, and I would encourage others to, you know, put a focus on that still in the process of dealing with COVID right now. Great point. And, and let's dig into that question a little bit that Princess brings up about self-care, taking care of yourself. Um, you know, one of the cliches you often hear when you're a caregiver is is someone will say to you or you'll read somewhere that you can't take care of others unless you take care of yourself, which is which is true, uh, but actually doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it can't happen all the time. Caregivers wind up taking care of other people a lot without taking care of themselves. You know, one, one person wrote in a question that's saying, how do, I, how do I meet my needs when my husband's needs must come first? I think that's true. I can remember times when I wanted to go out for a jog, but my mom needed help in the bathroom. Well, what are you gonna do? You know, I mean, there, there are times when it's hard to take care of your, yourself. So thoughts on that from, from everyone. Amy, why don't you start us out and then Tarn and, and Prentice and Christy, you can add in too. But how do you take care of yourself when needs are so demanding sometimes as a caregiver? Yeah, you know, I think um, some of that, quite honestly, um, is learning to kind of sit with those feelings. I know people hate to hear me say that, um, but uh, because it's something that we're 
live in a world where we're trying to distract and push away hard feelings and things like that. But quite honestly, sometimes um, I remember having a pretty intimate experience. My father um, suffered with Parkinson's uh, for many years and has passed. And a number of years I was back home in Southern California with him as to give my mom a break. And so... And I got a call from a cherished friend while I was out there saying, oh, we're all getting together in Los Angeles tonight. You know, we want you to come out. And, you know, I looked at my dad and I just knew there was just no way I could leave him that night even for a few hours. And I remember, you know, having to turn down the invitation and hanging up the phone. And I just kind of started crying a little bit because I just had to sit with, you know, things are different now, and 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 it's hard, but but that's okay. You know, I have this moment with my dad. So sometimes your perception of how you view a situation uh, can really go a long way in how you kind of deal with it. Thank you, Turn, Any any thoughts you want to add in your experience, both as a daughter and as you've you've observed your your folks. Yeah, I think having an understanding of what your um, minimum required necessities are is really important. Um, so, you know, if if for you that's connecting with a grandchild once a week, or you know, going outside once a day, really making sure that you're hitting that minimum. Um, and, and it shouldn't always be at the minimum, right? We want it to be above the minimum, but making sure that, um, yes, yes, it's okay. Is that, you know, it's important to be flexible within that. So if your ideal is to go out first thing in the morning for a jog and, you know, somebody else needs help in the morning, that's okay. You can go for a jog later, but have an understanding that it's important to, um, you know, that you have these things that are important to you. The other thing that I do that I found very useful over the years is I write a gratitude list every day. I make a list of 10 things that I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. Um, And what that does is it doesn't just change my perspective. It doesn't just make me feel positive. It also reminds me of what my priorities are. So I can really be living my priorities throughout the day, the next day. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Thank you um, for offering that, um, Taryn. Um, that leads to the, another audience question that's just come in about um, how you avoid burnout. Um, uh, Amy Cheshire, would you say that that's, that's taking off from what uh, Taryn just said about reminding yourself of, of what's being, what makes you grateful, reminding yourself of kind of the minimum that you need. Are those, would you say, Amy, keys to, to avoiding burnout? Yeah, definitely. I think as many tools as you have in that toolkit, um, you know, are going to be helpful. Um, And, you know, another big one is often, we often kind of prescribe around here to the caregivers. um, You need, you know, sort of time off from Parkinson's. Okay. Um, Sometimes we literally write prescriptions (laughs) to caregivers um, to whatever activity uh, they used to enjoy that they have stopped doing. Um, For example, whether it's golfing or hiking or um, to really sort of mandate in a way or strongly recommend um, getting back to that. Because the thing that you realize is like, it's just like with parents, right? When mom's super unhappy, boy, it has a huge trickle-down effect on kids Mm -hmm. often. So, you know, as a caregiver, um, if you are really finding yourself getting, you know, more short-tempered with somebody, which, as you alluded to early on, Dave, is very common in caregiving, finding yourself the littlest of thing is kind of getting you more irritable. Um, these are all big red flags, right? That you're you're headed, you know, into this burnout um, state. So, yeah, whatever you can do and have a lot of things available to get time off from Parkinson's, things that will fill your cup, and it's totally different for each person. A lot of caregivers will say, "Well, I don't have time, right?" <laughs> to do that. There just aren't, that sounds really lovely, Amy, but 
you know, the reality, if you come over to my house, um, is that's not available to me. And so sometimes, you know, a lot of our research around resilience, in other words, what are the things that help caregivers to be successful? It doesn't have to be a lot or extensive. Even finding, I'll often say, do you have one to five minutes a day where you can really, uh, whatever it might be, sit down, just do a couple of really deep breaths to kind of get your central nervous system a little bit more calmed down. Uh, you can do that every hour, you know, uh, if needed. So um, we just want caregivers to recognize when they really are headed towards that burnout, um, the sooner that we can try to help you figure out ways to avoid that, um, the better off everybody's going to be. We're going to take a look at our, our the, advance our next slide so that that can be on the screen with us during this webinar to talk a little bit more about about the, the resource question where you where you turn for help because I I do think people have that experience you're describing Amy where it's like well that sounds good but that's not the way it, it works at yeah. at my house and maybe one thing and I'd be curious to hear others comment on this is to sort of accept the fact that those short little moments that you've each described. They don't so much, at least in my experience, when I was caring for my mom, it's not that they fully recharge your batteries. And so not to really even have that expectation. It's not like if you get away for a night that you're gonna come back and think, okay, it's, I'm good to go now. That may not necessarily happen, but, but what can happen is you have that one night, right? You have that and to fully appreciate that that time, that moment, and to just live that. It sounds like a cliche, but to take that in, rather than necessarily thinking that now everything's gonna be good from, from this point forward. Anyway, that's that's my two cents, but I'd, I'd love to hear more from, from others. Um, Christy and, and, and Prentice, back to you for a moment, and then and then Taryn, chime in too on, on ways you can kind of, um, that, that you found restorative, I guess. Yeah, I like what you said about living the moment. You know, be in the moment of that you get the break and then don't keep trying to live in that moment as you get back into the routine. You know, it's like, okay, oh no, here I am again. But what I was gonna say from the patient perspective is that sometimes we have to realize that they need a break and then they need time away. And it becomes very, the whole thing becomes very focused on us and on what we're doing and it's hard sometimes to step to let them go do what they need to do or to let someone else come and take their place we don't want to we don't want anyone else to take care of us that's what happened with my mother-in-law is that she couldn't get out of the house because my, our stepdad grandfather he was like no you i won't have anyone else that you take care of me and so we have to just realize that our caregivers need those, those moments and give them those moments and see, and, you know, and just see who else, be accepting of what that may be to us and the impact that may have. I would just add to that, that, you know, check in periodically throughout the day. And, and we do that. I, you know, we ask, you know, what do you have going on at this time? What do you have going on at this time? Um, you know, and then that gives me an idea, okay, how can I fit exercise in which that's important for me uh, to, to be able to do it. Sometimes I do it in the morning, sometimes I do it in the evening, uh, but I do make sure that I try and get it in. But if I don't, you know, for whatever reason, then I know that the next day I may have the opportunity. Yeah, I think that constant check-in really makes a, a lot of sense. And, and I think you're so, wise and thoughtful, uh, uh, Christy, to, to realize that. And to, just as we were saying, we need to see it from the point of view of the person who's receiving care. You have to see it from the point of view of the person who's, who's, who's your, your partner. Speaks a little bit to this one um, uh, question that I, I, I want to uh, raise, which is um, uh, this, this person asks, um, how do you handle some a situation where the person with Parkinson's relies on the caregiver too much uh, and doesn't do enough things for him or herself? Um, so they they want to be kind of 
dependent. That's obviously not your situation, Christy and, and Prentiss. That's that's clear. But um, but Amy, what would you say about that? If someone you know, sort of like the the in law that Christy was describing, you know, mm -hmm. wants only care from one person and doesn't really want it from anyone else and doesn't necessarily want to do for themselves. Any thoughts, Amy, on how to respond to, to that situation? Um, yeah, boy, I keep getting the hard Yes, again, you're not alone. I guess that's one thing I would say, at least from my perspective here, uh, that, you know, this can be the flip side of this is that, you know, I often, um, a lot of times what's behind that in my experience is, is fear. So the person with Parkinson's um, often has a number of fears going on, whether they're able to share these or not, but I'll tell you some common ones that tend to drive that um, is, you know, is my caregiver always gonna be able to be here? Mm -hmm. Are they always going to be able to hang in there? Um, how bad is this gonna get? And these are common questions that caregivers are often wrestling with at about the same time. Um, and the big one is, you know, am I sort of gonna be abandoned? Is this gonna get so hard that, that everyone's gonna kind of check out on me? And so sometimes instead of getting into a lot of the minutia of what I call of these kind of things, is if you can tap into a little bit more of the underlying feeling that's going on. You don't have to be a social worker to do this, just be a human being. Um, you can often get behind some of what's going on there, but to know that a lot of it is driven, it can seem very resistant to you, and why don't you just do more, and I know yesterday you were able to get that shirt on, but today, for the life of you, you can't seem to do anything. Um, again, if you can step back and try to identify a little bit more about maybe what's driving that, um, you might have a little bit more success except, you know, with it. I think that's really, really insightful, um, Amy. Thank you. I want to get, Taryn, your perspective on this question, too. But before I come to you, we have a great question coming in, which is, uh, how do we find someone like you, Amy? Um, so so if people need, if people need um, uh, social work assistance or, or just assistance in general, suggestions on where to turn, where to find resources? Yeah, a couple of quick suggestions. Um, yeah, the more you can expand your team, the better, I think, okay? Um, and so certainly one, there are, I'll put a plug in for the Parkinson's Foundation Centers of Excellence, which are all around the country and actually international as well. Um, so they're, they're located um, in various, you know, large and small cities. That's a great resource to reach out. Usually they're always going to have a social worker there that is um, part of the team and is more, much more focused on movement disorders and Parkinson's in particular. Um, if that's not available to you, um, I think the other big piece is a big push for caregivers' mental health you know, about 50% of caregivers at some point in the caregiving experience are gonna really experience a, a clinical depression. So this is not just being kind of down in the dumps. This is where your mood is starting to impact your sleep and your eating and your energy and all those things. So uh, these days I would put, since people are probably tuning in from all over, um, a couple of quick online resources for that that I often utilize actually because we service people from all parts of upstate New York. Um, either psychologytoday.com has a great resource for finding therapists um, and you can really drill it down to your insurance and your location and area of specialty. And um, so that's a good resource. Also, uh, betterhelp.com is, is definitely all Zoom-based uh, mental health, um, but another really terrific resource um, to reach out to, to take care of your mental health. Thank you. Those are those are helpful. Let me mention one more that we just started at the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation, which is something we're calling the Buddy Network, and there's a link to it on our resource page. But it's just a way of kind of matching people up. So if you want to reach out to someone in your community um, to talk about some of these issues, whether that's to talk with another care partner or to talk with someone else who has Parkinson's, 
the Buddy Network, which is something that, that the Michael J. Fox Foundation is just starting, is another way of providing that sort of networking and that sort of resource support. Um, Taryn, um, um, your thoughts as you've been um, listening to this about this question of, of, of how to both of avoid uh, burnout and, and you've worked as such a team with your siblings about providing support uh, when it's really needed for both your mom and your dad. Humor goes a long way. Um, you know, I often ask myself two questions. Um, how can I make this light? And how can I help my dad maintain his sense of dignity right now? Um, and when I frame it that way, firstly, I get out of my, um, I get out of myself. So I'm not as, you know, focused on my own stress and I'm just focused on this concept of dignity, which kind of flips a switch for me. Um, and then, you know, when my dad has had really hard times, I've made it a point to watch something funny for five minutes at the end of every day. And uh, that works for me. I mean, some people might have different practices, but, but it really, really helps. The other thing and I wanted to say uh, earlier, whatever. actually, that I think is important about the nagging is also just to remember that Parkinson's is a cueing disease. So when we cue a person, it gets them unfrozen. So if you say something like big step, it might help them to move. Um, and so maybe what feels like nagging to you is actually really useful at times. I just wanted to, I thought that was important to add. Yeah, no, thank you, Turn. And I'm gonna stay with you though for an answer to your own question, if you can provide it, about um, how you do uh, uh, help your dad maintain um, dignity. Because I think that's an important question. What have you found uh, is, is useful uh, in that regard? I, firstly, I don't do for him what he can do for himself. Mm -hmm. um, I, when we've been in situations where we're in a hospital, I try to really listen to what he wants. And I make sure that all questions are addressed towards him. Oftentimes yeah. in hospitals, the doctor will uh, address the question to the caregiver. And then I'll just turn and say, dad, and I'll repeat the question, um, or what do you think? Um, and if there's a time when maybe he can't articulate it as, as fully as he might want, I might say, well, what I think is this, is that right? Um, those are a few different strategies, but again, it's just always making sure that he feels involved, he's there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I came to really appreciate those people with my mom as her dementia increased who, rather than turning to me or saying to me, oh, isn't she sweet, would look right at her and talk right to her. You know, they, they, had, they only had eyes for her, uh, not, not, not for me. And I, I think that that is a, a quality that, that matters um, a lot. Um, Let's, um, we're going to focus the rest of our, our remaining uh, time, which is not much, I'm afraid, on, on getting to as many more questions as we can. Um, here's one that just came in, um, which is advice when you don't feel appreciated, when you feel like you're giving so much. Um, Taryn or, or Prentice, you want to respond to that? How do, you, how do you handle that if you don't feel you're being appreciated? Taryn? I'll, I'll let Brent just start. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that, uh, um, you know, Taryn, she, she said this very, at the very beginning, is to make sure that you're living your purpose and that you stay focused on that, even though you may not be getting that feedback directly, you know, from, from your care partner. I, I mean, from the, from the patient. I'm currently right now not having that experience, you know, because of our situation, I saw that happen with my mom, uh, you know, unfortunately, but it's, it's something that I think really speaks, you know, to me is to make sure you're living who you are, even though you may not be getting that direct feedback from the pay person you're caregiving for. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Prentice. 
Um, question on on uh, which is one that comes up, and I'm sure Amy, you've you've mm -hmm. dealt with this many times. So I'm going to turn this back to you. Which is um, how do you go about um, uh, talking with someone with Parkinson's when it's when it's time for that person, let's say it's your partner, to stop driving? How do you have that conversation, Amy? Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um... This can, uh, I think some of this, as the years gone by, I've kind of, you know, driving represents something different to a lot of people. Um, and for folks that um, it, it definitely uh, really has been something that's um, maybe been a part of their job, for example. My point is that just that some folks have a, you know, much harder go with the idea of changing in their driving than other people. And so some families will not have a big issue with this and others it will be like their hardest thing they ever had to deal with in terms of Parkinson's. If you're in that latter camp, um, I would, a couple of ideas, you know, either if you're blessed to have a driving evaluation program in your community, which many are, if you uh, contact kind of your office on aging, they might be able to point you in the right direction. This gets you out of the hot seat because quite honestly, none of us are good driving evaluators, okay? Uh, as doctors and providers, we're not good driving evaluators. We can evaluate your Parkinson's, but we aren't really in a good place to evaluate your driving. And the same for families. So if you can turn it over to kind of a third party um, to basically to be able to do a driving evaluation, if it's available, that's wonderful. And then I encourage people with Parkinson's, this is your opportunity. If you think you're a great driver, this is your opportunity to shine and to demonstrate that. So that's one way. The other one, if you don't have that available, is to probably kind of fall back on your doctor. Um, most of them are willing to fall on this sword for you. Um, and it becomes, you know, part of their medical record then, you know, if they've been advised, um, you know, by their doctor to give up driving. But it can take some of the heat off of you uh, again. And uh, it's just a, a really um, hard situation overall. They are. And all of these questions are, are hard and, and yeah. uh, challenging. And, and but I think coming back to this point about being willing to talk about them, being willing to ask is the starting point mm -hmm. and and allowing yourself a lot of room for um, for forgiveness, uh, both of yourself and the, and the person you're living with when you reach some of these difficult, uh, challenging uh, situations. Just have a few minutes left, and I'd, I'd love to have us finish by having each of you give us some some last thoughts um, and and kind of your best um, takeaway advice on on managing this situation during this challenging time of the pandemic and also during the holidays, which which have their own challenges as well. So, Amy, let me start with you, and then and then we'll go to uh, Taryn next after that. But just a brief last bit of advice, please. Um, yeah, I thought actually if I can, I came across this when I was doing some research here for today's webinar, um, a column that I wrote a number of years ago, uh, and uh, I started it off by um, sharing a couple lines from a poem that was called Love that was written um, by Mae Sarton, and I thought, I'll, I know I just have a minute or so, but I'm just going to read these, a uh, couple of these lines from her poem, which is... Um, it's about love, and she compares it to a spider's web that is both fragile and easily broken. And so these are the final lines of the poem. She says, spiders are patient weavers. They never give up. And who knows what keeps them at it? Hunger, no doubt, and hope. And so I hope that people that are dealing with Parkinson's disease will really find the ways to remember the hunger they have for the past and how things have changed, but also to kind of really try to keep sort of that hope alive, um, it really can help to kind of keep those batteries charged up. Yeah. And my, and keep, uh, yeah, to keep going, right? To keep and keep weaving that, that keep web. Keep weaving, a, yes, a, keep a, weaving. A yeah. Yeah. Taryn, a last thought from you, please. I would say really lean into your community right now. 
you are not alone. Everyone is having some kind of experience with the pandemic and, you know, reach out, ask how you can be there. And um, if you can find someone to have a, a Zoom dance party with, just to get <laughs> moving, or if you can go out and enjoy the sunshine for five minutes, it makes a really big difference. Great. Thank it's you. <laughs> yeah. And Christy and Paris. I would say you you can keep moving forward because you can work through this journey. You've faced challenges, challenges before. You've found out how to communicate and work through them. And you can be patient with yourself and the other person and just work through it. And you, you can do this. And I, and I would close by saying, you know, be resilient. And, and if you don't understand, learn what that means, you know, for yourself. And then also widen your network. Uh, there, there's there's so much resources and, and people that are willing to help and don't be afraid to ask for that help. Exactly. Thank you all so very much, uh, Prentice and, and Christy Brooks, uh, Taryn Fixall and um, Amy Cheshire. Thanks all for being part of this uh, conversation. It's It's been really helpful, I think, for, for all of us. Um, and thanks to, to all of you for participating in this webinar. Um, we'll be sending a link uh, to it so that you'll be able to watch it again and, and share it with others. Um, and, and all of us at the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation um, wish you a, a, a safe and happy um, holiday uh, season. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again next year.